everybody. Uh, welcome back to my channel, in case I haven't already said it, because I'm pulling out clips from everywhere. And if you haven't already noticed from my window behind me, um, the day has quite passed, and I virtually wasted it away um, talking to you online through your comments and through um, on your videos, and um, I clean the house, or at least I try to clean. I'm not sure um, what else I have to do around here. I have some furniture to be moving around, but um, I'm going to save that for another day. I virtually um, just finished supper, and I'm ready for bed. <laughs> So excuse the way I look, um, I've been cleaning all day and it's just one of those days where, you know, one thing led to another and, you know, I, I never went out at all today. So um, I, I did mention yesterday that I wanted to start on the um, Victoria Stafford case, which is, um, it's an older case and it's solved. The child was found. Um, however, it is still very fresh in the public eye, and so I've been pulling out all kinds of articles and trying to organize them chronologically, and so that took me a bit. I, I didn't realize it would take such a, a, a fair amount of time to organize these little bits and pieces from here and there and pull them all in into a... Uh, a chronological sequence of events. So um, virtually, it's it's your pretty much um, typical, um, I mean, the case itself is not typical, but I mean that it follows the patterns that we've been discussing regarding, um, you know, like uh, Christine Jessup, Nicole Moran, children who are virtually snatched while they are alone for a minute or two. Uh, and it goes back to me saying one day last week in the car how I think that the walking home from school or taking the bus home from school situation is it, it, not, it's not a good pattern to, um, it's not always a good pattern to focus on. And so um, one of the things that came up in this case was street proofing, just like in Alison Perot's case. Now, Alison and her brother were street proofed. However, her circumstances led her to trust her um, abductor into believing that he was someone that he actually wasn't. And so I think we can pretty much see the same pattern emerging in the Victoria Stafford case. Um, Tori Stafford was a nine-year-old Canadian girl who was born to uh, Rodney Stafford and Tara McDonald in uh, 2000. And this mom, uh, her boyfriend and two kids lived in Woodstock, Ontario. And uh, Tori's parents did divorce when she was two years old, and she had an older brother, Darren, and a little dog, Cosmo, Tori's quote-unquote bestest little friend. And so um, it just so happened that Tori uh, loved little doggies. And she dressed her own pooch in doll clothes and gave him little massages. What a doll. And she really, truly was almost like a living doll. Um, she was one of the cutest children I've ever seen. And um, I, of course, never met the Staffords, but uh, I know that, um, I know what they must have gone through when Tori went missing. So anyway, uh, let me get back to the street proofing. Now, um, in this situation, it's not clear how well Tori knew her abductor or how well, uh, or what she knew of her abductor. Uh, the contact was there between her mother, Tara Stafford, and her abductor, uh, who was uh, Terry Lynn McClintock. And so um, I, I'm going to go over the, um, the context, because the context is going to reveal 
the patterns that are usually present when children do go missing and when something does happen to them. And so, um, you know, I, I want everybody to understand that this family was picked apart, uh, I think even more so than the abductors and the murderers uh, themselves. And, you know, the thing is, is that, guys, people have problems. People deal with problems differently, and they learn how to deal with them through reinforcement. And so um, when something is positively identified, when a solution to one of your problems is positively identified with that recurring recurrence of going back to that same solution. Say, for instance, taking an aspirin for a headache. That's what I'm talking about. If you keep uh, getting rid of your headaches with aspirin, you're going to take it, right? You're going to take it again and again, right? So every time you get a headache, you're going to reach for that Tylenol or, or um, uh Motrin, whatever it is that you take for headaches. So bear with me when I when I say that I, I think we should reserve our judgment for the mother, Tara McClintock, because uh, Tara, I should say Tara um, McDonald, I'm sorry, because she was a very young mother. She got married at 17. And so she did kind of pick up some um, negative reinforcement uh, habits along the way. And she was young. She had two children, and then she got divorced in 2002 from her, from her husband, Rodney. And Rodney seems like such a nice chap. Um, I know that he suffered a great deal along with his ex-wife, Tara. And so... Um, Let's not judge anybody here. Um, if anything, judge the abductors and the kidnappers, uh, the murderers. Um, and even they need to be understood like that we can prevent these things from happening forever and ever. And so, um, as I was saying, uh, Tori had probably seen um, Terry Lynn's face before, and she was probably familiar to Tori. Now, I think, what I think, guys, is when we tell children, don't get in a car with anybody you don't know, do you think that's a smart thing to say? I, I think a better thing to um, advise would be don't ever get into a car without me around. Wouldn't that be better? Uh, just because you know somebody, say, for instance, just because somebody's face is familiar, do you hop in and hitchhike with that person? You know, because they may look like a famous actor or something. I'm, I'm going to the extremes here. But I'm just trying to show you how illogical and outdated that phrase, that motto has become. Uh, it does no longer apply to our dangerous times. Maybe in the 60s and 70s, it would have been, okay, if you know them, get in a car. Not anymore. Not anymore. So when you're street-proofing your child, I think you should think about the kind of city that you live in, the kind of people that are going to be surrounding your children all the time, and whether or not they should ever, ever get in the vehicle with anybody unless they get a text from you. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Now we have the technology to be that safe, so we should indeed practice it. So um, uh, this did not come to uh, reality with this case where nine-year-old Tori uh, vanished after she got into a car and so um, let's start with the story. So um, Darren, her older brother, usually walked Tori to and from school. After the family had moved to that place a week earlier. Now, at the previous address, Tori's school was right next door to the home. And so Tara McDonald would be able to see her children as they walked out of the schoolyard 
out of the school and into the yard and right up to her doorstep. So um, that uh, was no longer possible after the Staffords moved. And so um, that is one change that was all for the worse. Um, so two months before Tori's abduction, and it's, this would be two months before they moved, um, uh, Tara McDonald went to the tiny house where Carol McClintock lived with her daughter, um, Terry Lynn. And McDonald and Tara McDonald and her boyfriend, her living boyfriend, James Gorris, illegally bought Oxycontin, which is a, uh, a prescription drug from Carol. And I believe that that has been taken off the market, I hope. And so there were more purchases on separate days from Carol, between Carol and Gorris, and Tara McDonald, Tara McDonald herself returned to that home. So um, at the time of Tori's vanishing, um, uh, McDonald, Tara McDonald was a very uh, heavy Oxycontin user. Uh, and she had been using this drug since 2005. It's very easy to get addicted to this drug. And so um, it's for very severe pain. And it's not likely that all these people who got addicted had such severe pain. You know what I mean? Because most of them were young individuals with no pain, really, to mention. But they did claim to have pain. So they got addicted to this. And so um, it, it did become a very expensive habit for her. And now I don't know what problems Tara Mc, uh, McDonald may have had. She was obviously divorced from her uh, husband, Rodney, and um, she had two children by him. And so even after James Gorris moved in with her, I, I believe that she may have been anxious or maybe, you know, experiencing difficulties adjusting to life um, on her own. Uh, I don't know what it is, guys, that some of these women who think that they have to have a man by their side in order to be happy. Well, this isn't one of them. This isn't one of those situations where a woman is better off with a man. Maybe she might have been better off with Rodney. <laughs> not James. So, um, and I'll tell you why in a minute. So uh, McDonald lost weight and her health was failing. And so uh, at one point she did take herself to a methadone clinic, but she was still not completely cured and kept falling back into her old habits. And so, like I said, I don't know what it could have been that was pushing her, uh, you know, into that uh, world, and so um, into that world of drug abuse. So Carol, uh, Terry Lynn's mother, had a couple of dogs as well. They were, the, it was of the same, they were of the same breed that the McDonald's had. And so the two women would discuss breeding them. Uh, but nothing really ever came of that because basically because um, uh, the child went missing uh, pretty much very soon after that. And so, um, hold on. It's So it is not precisely clear how well acquainted Tori was with Terry Lynn. And I really don't know if it would make a difference because just because you know somebody or you don't know somebody, I don't think it would have changed the course of events that took place. And so, um, uh, Terry, Tori was with Terry Lynn McClintock on the afternoon that she left from school. Uh, and she did so willingly with the then mysterious abductor who happened to be captured by um, surveillance camera footage, I assume uh, from the school. And so um, McDonald, Tara McDonald, told the court later that she had no knowledge, even though she did know Terry Lynn briefly, um, 
she knew her mother a little bit more. Um, she told the court that she had, she didn't know if Toya had ever met McClintock previously. So um, I, I don't mean that she wasn't aware. I, she wasn't aware, but she said she, I didn't explain that right. It's not that she didn't know whether she did or she didn't. She said she had no knowledge of it. So I, I think it that we should mean it should mean that um, she did not. She realized that Tori did not know um, Terry Lynn McClintock. Okay, so this Terry Lynn McClintock is the daughter of the drug dealing Carol. Sorry, Carol. I don't know how else to describe you in a short phrase. And so um, Tori had been street proof, but guys at eight years old, you know, your life changes from one day to the next. Um, at eight years old, you, you can't be street proofed um, and you can't be street smart at the same time. Uh, not at eight years old. And so um, she had been cautioned not to go with strangers. Obviously, in my opinion, McClintock was a familiar face. Not very familiar, but vaguely familiar. And probably because she had been seen in the presence of her mother, uh, maybe at the house of one or the other. I am not sure. Um, nobody is sure. Um, it could be that... Um, Terry Lynn came to the house when the children were asleep. <coughs> Excuse me. When the children were asleep, it could be that they came, they came late at night after the children were put to bed. And so um, Tara McDonald could never be really sure. I'm not, I'm not clear on what the circumstances were. Um, so, but McClintock was clearly not a complete stranger to um McDonald herself, Tara. Tori was abducted from Woodstock, attacked and murdered by Michael Rafferty and Terry Lynn McClintock. Rafferty didn't say much after Tori's death, um, only to Terry Lynn that we should never speak of it again. And so um, I'm going to change this now. And hold on, I'm going to continue with the other part. And so um, it's important that the next part that I tell you is, in my opinion, very clearly linked to what happened to poor little Tori Stafford, um, a beautiful little girl who was just starting out in her early childhood. And um, her life was snuffed out because, I don't know, it didn't make sense to me when I read the story and it still doesn't make any sense, but I, I see a possible link, a, a probable link. And so um, let's talk about the suspects. Um, before it happened, um, OxyContin debt and fraud uh, that Tara's boyfriend accrued because he scammed somebody for 20 or 30 pills and left a $400 debt or to dealers. Now I wonder if the murderer could have been a dealer. So um, anyway, on um, Tara's first visit to Carol's very tiny home, um, she was introduced to Terry Lynn, who was leaving the house just as Tara was entering. And the second time that she saw Terry Lynn, uh, the girl was quite under the influence of drugs. So. Um, now, Tara doesn't know if Tori may have overheard discussions at home that uh, Tara had with um, her boyfriend about breeding the dogs or, or if she had heard the McClintic name come up. I, I believe that Tara is probably trying to cover her substance abuse um, or the uh, frequency of her substance abuse by trying to play down the familiarity between um, Tori and Terry Lynn. I don't know if there's more to it than that. Um, 
I really don't. It, it did not come up in court. And so um, it's not clear if Tori or her 11-year-old brother Dar Darren understood their mom's drug addiction or her, their mom's boyfriend's drug addiction, for that matter. So um, that morning, that final morning, uh, Tara's last moments with Tori um, were spent allowing her to borrow the butterfly earrings. What a nice, what a nice pouting. Um, uh, butterfly earrings. That's so ironic, isn't it? And she put a little clear glass on Tori's lips and she brushed a little blush on Tori's cheeks. That's beautiful, guys. Um, that is so... I, I, I find that so irking and ironic, don't you? Putting blush on your daughter on the last time that you see her. It's... it's I don't know. It's... Um, wow. That is really pure symbolism <laughs> in, the, in the raw flesh. Um, so... That was the first morning. And so let's let's go back into the afternoon. Let's push back ahead a few hours and go right into the afternoon. I believe it was a Friday. And um, McClinton, McClintock, Terry Lynn McClintock, drove, up, drove along with her boyfriend and they pulled over somewhere near the school. And McClintock abducted Tory outside her Woodstock, Ontario school, um, Oliver Stevens Public School, around 3.30 p.m. on April the 8th, 2009, just as Tory was leaving the school ground. And that part is captured on security, uh, as well as Tory being led down Fife Avenue in Woodstock, by a woman who is later identified as Terry Lynn. Now, Terry Lynn lured, just like Calvin Hoover lured Christine, she lured Stafford to a waiting vehicle with um, Rafferty in the driver's seat with the promises of a, a new puppy. Uh, and why did she do this, guys? Because Rafferty would probably give her drugs, and he was urging for the company of a young female. And so um, the couple drove Tory over 100 kilometers north to a remote rural area where uh, Rafferty assaulted Tory, and, and Terry Lynn said she used a hammer to kill the child with blows to the head. Later we find out that um, that part was done by the man and not Terry Lynn. I, I believe that is the case. When Tori, when Tori failed to return home and was reported missing by her grandmother at 6 p.m., um, they had been, Darren and the grandmother had been searching for two hours. She was supposed to be home at 3.45, and so uh, she had already been missing for over two hours, and so um, they filed a, a report. Um, on the day that Tori went missing, um, Tara McDonald's mother drove the children to school in the morning, but she didn't pick them up. I don't think she was in the habit of picking them up. We're not sure about that. Tara McDonald herself went to the Salvation Army that day for food, but she would use money to buy drugs. And that's an addiction, guys. That's what it does. Um, and she visited her grandfather in a retirement home and returned home. I, I find that a little odd. Um, anyway, Darren accompanied another child home first. Uh, I guess he was in that routine. And so um, he actually uh, took the child home first and then went back to school. So this is it, guys. This is where um, Tori, the weakness of that um, after school situation fell right through. You can't have a child alone after school. 
You can't. Not at eight years old. Most certainly not at 11 either. So um, when Darren swung back to the school to pick up Tori, she was no longer there. And so um, Tori actually never showed up. She never showed at 3.45 p.m. And later, a lawyer implied um, to Tara that Tara was not sufficiently alarmed when her mother and Darren went out and spent two or more hours uh, going through the neighborhoods looking for Tori. She didn't, she didn't join in. She just lounged around because she was, um, she was out of it, guys. She was probably falling all over the place. And that's, that's it, guys. That, this, this is it. Um, that's the weakness. I, somebody had this planned out. Um, I'm not sure if it was all, you know, random. It wasn't random. It was well thought out. And because it was a regular situation for Tara to do this, um, Carol and Terry Lynn would have known when the best time to strike would be. Now, I'm not suggesting that Carol had any part of this, no. What I'm saying is that it was a routine, and so they knew when to strike. And so um, Tara McDonald, no, I think it was the grandmother that called Tori's friends to check around and see if uh, Tori had been there. And Tara did return home um, after afterwards hoping that um, Tori would phone or show up. So I guess at first Tara wasn't concerned and then she began to get concerned. I would say maybe after five o'clock when she really knew something was wrong. Um, I, I don't know what was what. Um, now, her, Tara's mother went to the police station at 5.45 p.m against the wishes of Tara, because Tara thought, well, you know, maybe she's playing somewhere. I think it's a little too premature to get the police involved. No, no, you're just hoping against hope. Um, she was in denial, I think, at that point. Uh, and plus, I don't think she could trust her judgment, guys. So suspicion did fall initially on the mother, Tara McDonald. And um, even because at first she couldn't be convinced that there was actually something wrong. No, this couldn't be happening to us. Tara, Tori wouldn't disappear like that. No, not on her own. She had help disappearing. And so by then, guys, it was much too late. Um, Tara McDonald, um, okay, suspicion came to fall on the mother, Tara McDonald, and because she didn't report her child missing for two hours, even though she realized, of course, that it was only a few minutes walk. Still, you go pick up your child. It's a new neighborhood, right? It was a new neighborhood, guys. So, um, no, wrong thing to do. I'm not judging her. I'm just saying that's, it's like, Christine Jessup's mother, she made a mistake. She made a mistake. You could say maybe she might have been more negligent than she normally would be, but she made a mistake to leave her daughter home after school with nobody around. Um, kids go missing. So um, five days after Tor uh, Tori Stafford's disappearance, um, what the police were doing is they were searching the school grounds, you know, looking inside the building, looking in the yard, looking beyond the yard. And so the school eventually it, it reopened on the next day, which I think it would have been the following um, week. And so the case was featured on April 25th, uh, 2009, on America's Most Wanted. And the investigation, which was led by local police, was later turned into a joint investigation with the OPP. And it switched from a missing person case 
to an abduction case. Um, and so at that time, guys, picture the scenario. Tara McDonald was unemployed. She waited two hours to finally become convinced that something was wrong with her daughter, uh, Tori. Um, she was addicted to drugs. Uh, she wouldn't uh, help in the search. And the grandmother did search and later filed the missing report, the missing person's report. And so that is why McDonald, Tara McDonald, was initially suspected as being the person in that security footage. It wasn't that clear. So um, anyway, on May the 20th, 2009, the police charged Michael Thomas Christopher Stephen Rafferty, 28 years old, 28, just like Calvin Huber was when he first did that to Christine, um, with first degree murder and Terry Lynn McClintock, 18, what was he doing with an 18 year old? With accessory to murder and lesser charges in abduction and suspected murder of Tory Stafford. Okay, so I think we're going to break off here and um, we're going to pick up with this next time because um, I, I don't want to go on and on and, you know, make this another hour long video. I hope I haven't already done that. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. And um, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.